Whether you rushed to the theater to see It Chapter 2 the day it came out, or have been a little more weary about going to see a giant clown on a huge screen do scary clown stuff for three hours, you might still have the same question. Where does Pennywise really come from? Well, we're here to answer that question once and for all, or at least present some pretty compelling theories about the whole thing. We'd like to start things off by saying that we know that Stephen King's source material has a whole lot of detailed info about the whens and whys of Pennywise. But since this is a movie channel and not Oprah's Nightmare Book Club, we're going to stick to what we know best, the movies. Which have, of course, diverted in their own ways from the original novel for worse or for better. And in the case of one infamous, seriously cringe-inducing, friendship boundary-pushing group scene that we can't really talk about here for the way, way better. So while we will go into some details from the books, this video is going to talk about some of what we know we know, and some of the most exciting theories out there that try to provide some insight into the ever-mysterious Pennywise the Clown. So like little Georgie in that sewer drain, let's dive right in. What do we know for sure about Pennywise? Well, nothing exactly, because he, or whatever you call an entity such as it, has been around for far too long for an exact account. It is isn't even really a clown, or a human for that matter. It is actually something of an otherworldly creature who has been around for thousands, if not millions, if not billions of years. While we might not get all the info about where exactly it comes from, what is pretty widely accepted is that it arrived on Earth from somewhere in the universe or another, some thousands of years ago, and has set about terrorizing humans ever since, specifically the humans of Derry, Maine, where it pops up to feed on them every 27 years. Because everybody's gotta have a hobby, I guess. Long before the Losers Club we know and love showed up in Derry, it was inhabited by First Nations people known as the Shogun. Kokopiwa. We learn from Mike in It Chapter 2 that it is its encounter with these people that really jump-started his whole every 27-year binge and purge cycle, and that after things got ugly more than enough times, the Shokopiwa migrated to the outskirts of town in order to get some much-needed space from the murderous entity. Here's a hot tip, if an entire town's worth of people literally pack their bags and move to get away from you, maybe you're coming on just a little bit too strong. Try rethinking your approach. Be smooth. Devour their children a little less. If they don't swipe right on you, don't find them on Facebook or DM them on Instagram. Let it breathe a little. If it's meant to be, they'll come back. Or you know, not. Probably because of all that child chomping we mentioned earlier. And that whole conjuring up your worst nightmare and presenting it to you thing it seems to enjoy so much. You see, it doesn't just like to feed on people who have been happily holed up in the comfort of their own home, watching Property Brothers for the last three consecutive days while wearing a Snuggie and eating a bag of pretzels. Oh no, he likes his dinner frightened. The clown claims that fear acts as something of a seasoning for his dinner. And so he uses his ability to shapeshift into just about anything in order to turn into his subject's worst nightmare before he devours them. But since it's pretty safe to say that there probably weren't any circus clowns wandering around town back in the days of the Shokopiwa people for a supernatural torture demon to draw inspiration from, where and when did he develop his iconic look? Well, when trailers for IT Chapter 2 were first released, fans everywhere started buzzing about a few different possible explanations for this. It all started with that scene in which we see the grown-up Beverly revisiting her old home, now occupied by the immediately unsettling elderly Mrs. Kirk. Beverly, who has apparently never seen a horror movie before, decides to stick around for a while, while Kirsch insists on serving cookies and talking about her father in a truly excellent New England accent. Mrs. Kirsch tells Beverly that when she was young, her father just happened to make his living as a circus clown, right as Beverly spots a framed photo of an older man with an all-too-familiar smile. The man, who is immediately recognized by fans everywhere as Bill Skarsgård without his clown makeup on, is standing right next to a wagon with the words, Pennywise the Dance and clown painted on the sides. At the end of the trailer, we also caught a glimpse of a very scary and gross-looking Pennywise in an old-timey outfit, clawing himself in the face. Well, IT Chapter 2 ties those moments together and seems to offer some explanation of what really is going on here. As, and this was in the trailer so we aren't really spoiling anything, Mrs. Kirsch reveals herself to be Pennywise in disguise, causing Beverly to run for the door. At the last second, she looks back and sees the human version of Pennywise from the picture actually applying his clown makeup, and then doing that oh-so-charming face-clawing thing that we talked about just a second ago, creating his trademark appearance. 
So what does all of this mean? Well, as most theories about this moment go, this was the moment that the entity known as It discovered his favorite and most frightening alter ego, Pennywise. Whether he inhabited the body of Papa Kirsch and became Pennywise that way, or simply copped his look, we don't really know. But either way, ever since becoming the clown, he has taken a real shine to the look. According to the book, It prefers children because they are easier to catch and to frighten, and he knows that clowns are what children are the most afraid of. And he just seems to be having a genuinely great time dancing around his Pennywise. So what's the harm? Oh yeah, everything that he does, right on. But it's almost impossible to know if any of that is exactly true, as he really isn't that forthcoming with the exposition that Pennywise. There are some out there who wonder if appearing as Mrs. Kirsch's father was just more nightmare fuel for Beverly in particular. As we all know, Beverly's father was a particularly terrible person, who treated his daughter in perhaps the worst possible way. It would make sense that Pennywise would exploit that trauma, using a father figure as a way to hit Bev where it hurts the most, and conjure as much of that tasty fear from her as he possibly could. If he knows anything, Pennywise knows how to get right to the heart of his victim's deepest fears, and a terrifying father would be just about the scariest thing he could do to Bev. To some fans, it still seems odd that a seemingly ancient, all-powerful demon thing, whose friendly nickname is the Eater of Worlds, would stick around a town like Derry, only to wake up every 27 years to chow down on a couple of kids before going back to sleep. There's just too much power there for that to make sense, right? Why wouldn't it rampage all over the world, do a little more eating, maybe see Hawaii? What is this connection to the town of Derry all about anyways? Well, some believe that there's a very specific reason for that. They actually think that Derry is what is keeping it alive for all this time, as the town and the clown, sorry, are linked. You see, the idea is that Derry is actually a reflection of its soul, or whatever the monstrous being equivalent is. That, when it, or rather, its body was almost defeated the first time, the town of Derry was seriously damaged in the process. But as the town healed, it also simultaneously rebuilt it as well, unknowingly providing it with sanctuary and food in order to recuperate and come back for more, 27 years later to be precise. If the town had been abandoned by people and turned to rubble, some think it would have actually lost all of his strength and eventually been defeated by time and neglect. So the reason it stays in this tiny, seemingly uninteresting town is that it has to to survive. There is another question about Pennywise that still has audiences and fans scratching their heads after viewing both chapter 1 and chapter 2. And that is this. If it is already thousands of years old and doesn't seem to abide by any constraints, then how is it that a group of human children have been able to take him down? Sure, maybe they didn't defeat him entirely, but they did some serious damage. Well, there is actually a very interesting idea that might just explain all of that. First of all, because it resides in a physical body on this earthly plane, that body can be wounded. It seems as though it has to play by the rules of whatever form it is currently inhabiting. So if it was, let's say, a gold goldfish, one good toss out of his bowl and onto the ground would be enough to incapacitate him, which means that he is actually vulnerable to beliefs. For example, if he was a vampire, he would be vulnerable to sunlight because that is what we believe about vampires. Likewise, he is vulnerable to the Losers Club because they come to believe that their friendship is strong enough to destroy him. And if you don't think that the collective will of a group of preteens is a good enough weapon to be used against someone, no matter how ancient they may be, well then you probably never went to middle school, did you? You're telling us that a group of kids all yelling insults at you at full volume isn't enough to make you want to go underground for 27 years only to eventually re surface with a mind full of vengeance? Kids are mean on their own, and a super confident group of them? Forget about it. This might be one moment that we actually sympathize with the disgusting demon. Gym class was rough, okay, and we will not be made to feel weird about that. Uh, anyways. So there's a lot of ideas out there about the true origins of Pennywise. Whether or not you believe all of them or not, the truth is we may never get the satisfying simple answer that we crave. That's the thing about supernatural beings. They're not so easy to pin down. The things that we know for sure are that Pennywise has spent some thousands of years or so terrorizing Derry and its inhabitants, that it feeds on fear and has some serious boundary issues, and the thing that we understand the most about Pennywise the Dancing Clown is that we might not ever totally understand Stand him. Is he simply a vicious predator who finds joy and satisfaction in his brutal business of devouring the youths of the day, and then requires something like a 27-year hibernation period to sleep it off, like a demented post-Christmas dinner nap? Or is he more complicated than that? 
more, dare we say, vulnerable? Lucky for us, Derry doesn't exist, and you still have to go out of your way to find a clown these days. So unless you really want one, for the most part, you can spend your days happy and clown-free. Now throw on your Snuggie, open a bag of pretzels, turn on whatever home renovation channel puts you the most at ease, and rest easy knowing that Pennywise isn't coming after you. Until they readapt the story in about another decade. Oh, come back anytime. Bring your friends. What do you think about these Pennywise backstories? Have you seen It Chapter 2 yet? Do you have any more ideas about It's origins that we totally missed? Let us know in the comments down below, and while you're down there, why not subscribe to Screen Ramp for even more great videos just like this in your feed each and every day. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you at the movies. <laughs>